Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 80 of the podcast. And today, I'll be honest, I'm just puttering around in the crafty cottage. This is going to be kind of a freeform episode, and we're going to chat about a lot of different things that are going on. Um, but there's not going to be a real, like, <laughs> you know, massive theme to the podcast, uh, mostly because it's just been crazy. I've got so many different projects going on at the same time. Uh, and I've kind of run out of goddess quilts now, so I guess that means that I need to get back to interviews, but of course that means I need to schedule them with people, and most professional quilters right this second are super, super busy getting ready for quilt market, so the people that I've been asking to come on the podcast, they're all saying, no, I can't come on, I'm too busy. So yeah, it's, it's a little challenging. If you would like to be on the podcast, and yes, normal, everyday uh, hobby quilters, I love to talk to everybody. I love to talk to professional quilters too. Uh, if you'd like to come on the podcast, send me an email and uh, give me a proposed topic that we can talk about. If you wanna debate with me over a quilting topic, if you don't agree with me on something that I have shared before in the past, I think that would make for an awesome podcast. Uh, I like to be able to learn from other people's experiences. And yeah, I'm definitely looking for more people to make friends with and more interviews in the next couple of months. So that would be a lot of fun. So what am I working on today? I have just moved my sewing machine back into the crafty cottage after, and I'll here I will move the camera around. And just so you know, there is audio and video for all of my podcasts so that you can see what I'm working on and see me puttering around in the crafty cottage today. Or you can just listen to the audio and kind of be confused why it's so loud and clanky <laughs> as I bang things around. Well, um, if you remember, we had the hurricane. Uh, it was actually Florence. Uh, when that was running through, I completely cleaned out the crafty cottage. I put, e I pulled everything out of here uh, to the point where I just had the tabletop and that was pretty much all I left. I even dragged the treadle uh, back into the house and then it was just a rainy weekend. It really wasn't much of anything, but getting everything back out, it's like it took, it took less than an hour to clean this place out completely and it had gotten really junky, but then it's taken three or four weeks to get everything back out here again. So yeah, I'm definitely not, not as good on the opposite end of that uh, clean out as the other way. You know, clean, cleaning it out and emptying it was fast and quick. Um, putting everything back and getting everything back in position is a lot more challenging. So finally got my machine back out here. I have been enjoying it though in the house. I set it up on my tabletops in the uh, in my studio where we usually cut fabric, and I set it up on a box, and I have been filming a few tutorials standing up. And uh, it's a little awkward because you know I'm, I'm operating the foot pedal with my foot and kind of standing slightly crooked in order to balance my weight. Sometimes I've been using the start stop button, but I found that really interesting. Uh, it made for a faster flow because of course standing up, you know, you don't tend to, <laughs> I, I don't tend to waffle on and on whenever I'm standing versus sitting. So it's definitely been something I'm thinking about. And of course I've been enjoying standing up more for, you know, several different tasks. So I, I enjoy standing for the long arm. When I do long arm quilting, uh, I have a standing desk. Uh, for writing and then when I'm writing in the morning uh, I usually do that at uh, I have a high bar in my kitchen I usually stand there and write on my iPad in the morning so I'm trying to do more standing throughout the day uh, instead of setting so I'm honestly thinking about doing a big change up in the crafty cottage and pulling out the melanine I have the melanine tabletop that kind of stretches side to side here and I'm thinking about pulling this whole thing out and rotating the setup 100, yeah, 180 degrees and standing for the tutorial. So I stand with my back against the wall. I could hang quilts on the wall. That would be nice. Um, and then to be able to have the machine then set up where I could, you know, I could have an overhead shot. I could have a face to face shot and then I could have a machine shot. So it's, it's a little technical, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. I really am. That's a big change though. And then if it didn't work, <laughs> to change it all back. And then the question is, what do I do with a big giant eight foot by four foot melanine board when I'm not using it? You know, it could get damaged. It's not, you know, it's about a half inch thick, but still, if you bang it around too much, uh, it could definitely get dinged up and it could get dirty. 
Uh, and Josh and I have already been talking about, we're out of storage, really. Uh, you know, he's got his chickens and fish and, you know, lots of animals and stuff to take care of. You know, I've got things like this mel melanine board and, uh, you know, the barn. We have a, a wood shop style barn and it just seems to be getting really, really full. You know, gardening tools, all at nine yards. So we're thinking about putting in another small shed on our property and you know getting it set up and that just take care of storage so I think this might be something that has to wait until then in order for me to try this out and just see if it will work I'm going to bend down and plug this machine in so that way it's ready to go oh, that feels good you know it's just you know I enjoyed shooting those tutorials uh, and it was largely because dad was spending a lot of time at home doing some design work and stuff for me that I was able to do that um, and then now that dad's come in and he's been testing Miss Bunny dolls, uh, he's been testing the patterns for me. Uh, you know, now it's like, well, I can't film. We're making too much noise with, you know, the three of us down in the basement. So I needed to move the machine back out again. And, uh, now that it's out, I'm realizing just how much space it was taking up and kind of, it was being a little bit distracting in the kitchen downstairs. So I'm kind of glad it's back out here again. And I can get back to normal tutorials, doing them the normal way. <laughs> and, you know, that's the thing. It's good to, you know, consider changing things up and trying new things. And certainly, you know, for the storm, I didn't want to potentially lose a machine, you know, or anything out here. And I love that it's totally cleaned out now. I mean, this is the cleanest the Crafty Cottage has been probably since I set it up, honestly. Uh, and I'll be honest, there's another kind of reason why I was not really looking forward to coming back out here. I've had a problem with ants, those little tiny ants now for a while, and it's been really bugging me. And I didn't realize just how much it had been bugging me until I finally took care of the problem. Actually, Josh took care of it for me. He called Orkin uh, and had an Orkin guy come out and uh, they treated the house and it's just significantly in, you know, improved everything around everywhere. And then they gave us some advice on what to do with the buildings that we have in the yard. And that was just really, really helpful. So I, I recommend them. I think Workin's a great uh, company. And if you're having trouble with bugs and we're, it's not just, it was those little ants, it was spiders. And we were getting a lot of those like centipede, millipede kind of guys too. I don't like bugs. <laughs> I'm not sorry to say it. I really don't like bugs. And when I'm doing a tutorial and an ant is like crawling up my machine and wiggling his tentacles at me, you know, it's just distracting. And I suddenly lose my train of thought and then I'm mad at the ant. And of course he then loses his life very quickly. Uh, but it's just, it's pulling me out of what I'm doing. Uh, and it was just on a continual basis. And I was, I was, I don't have any food in here, no food whatsoever, but they just kept coming in and being a problem. Uh, they finally did something about it or Josh did. And that's just really good. And now we're going to be on a, a regular system. So that way, hopefully this won't happen again. It won't be an issue again. And the crafty cottage will never have an ant problem because <laughs> it was just, you know, it was, it's like a small irritation, you know, like, and, and this can come into play in so many different things. I, at one point I had, um, the sewing room, I call it the kitchen. It, it's where we cut fabric. I have big tables and stuff. And at one point I had it set up and I had these little lights on the sides and they drove me crazy. And it was so dark in there. Uh, every time I'd walk in there, it would be like, God, I really want to change up these lights and fix it. And, uh, you know, and I, I just didn't want to be in the room until I finally took the time and fixed it. Uh, and I think that we can let things, little things like that drive us crazy, you know, for on and on and on until, you know, you got to just decide, hey, I've, I've had enough and this is limiting what I want to do and how I want to do it and, and make that stab and do something about it. So speaking of things I've been wanting to do, I have been wanting to try lino cutting and this is really neat stuff. Uh, so lino cutting is, uh, it's, a, it's a block printing method. And what that means is basically you make kind of a stamp and you can carve it yourself out of linoleum uh, or you know, it's kind of a special linoleum created for this that's a little softer, it's a little bit easier to cut. You cut it with tools that are similar to wood carving tools and this, craft actually came from block wood cutting but wood cutting you know it kind of has challenges because you've got the grain of the wood and that can cause you know breakouts and stuff and you can have more issues 
cutting the linoleum, you don't have any grain lines, so it's easier to cut, it's faster to cut, and you can make some really cool things with it. So I've been following some different lino cutters on Instagram. This is kind of the way, if ever I'm wanting to get into a craft, I, uh, I will look up a few, you know, I'll just kind of search it on Instagram. I'll look for people that have really pretty photos that post a lot, follow them on Instagram and just kind of brain dump on all of their pretty photos. And then eventually I will go buy the materials and tools and give it a try. So this is a tutorial that will be coming up soon because I wanted to shoot. Basically, I got the, I got like a little kit. And then I was like, you know, this is really perfect because it's so hard to capture that beginning phase, you know, of what it's actually like for a total beginner to do something. You know, it, you know, right now I can show you a beginner video on free motion quilting, but it's a beginner video being shown by an advanced person. It's tricky. I'm making it look a lot easier than it actually is. So I wanted to shoot a video showing lino cutting, lino cutting from a total beginner's perspective. So I cut two little stamps and then I cut this and it's a little thank you card and it, it's a little stamp to do that. And then I did lots of printing experiments and you might be able to see some of them over there in the corner. Uh, I just kept printing and printing until I ran out of as, you know, as much paint as I had put down. And I had a great time with this. It's a challenge to learn new things. It really is. And it's especially a challenge when you want it to come out really good. You know, I want to be able to use these cards. Uh, and, uh, you know, I learned a lot as far as how to cut, uh, you know, the paint, applying the paint was a lot more challenging than I expected it to be. There was a lot more nuances to that. And I think that's going to come with time and experience. But there's a reason why I wanted to try this. Uh, I feel like with quilting, and I don't, I don't want to offend anyone with this, but I feel like with quilting, there, there's the easy things to do and make, like zip, zippered pouches, okay? And a lot of people make zippered pouches and they're super easy but they're also super cheap. You know, you can't sell something like that for very much. It has low value. Same thing for quilts. Quilts take forever to make. And then, you know, and there's always lots of discussion about how much to charge and all this kind of stuff and what will the market bear. Um, I just don't ever feel like you're gonna be able to get what the quilt or that, you know, hand-sewn item is going to be worth. But lino cuts, you cut, the linoleum, you cut your design, and certainly it's gonna take some time and skill to build to be able to do that well. But once you build that skill and you cut a print, then you can use that multiple times and you can use that to print fabric. So this is something that I feel like, I feel like quilters and sewists really need to look for, you know, people that want to sell their work basically. Uh, I think you need to look for higher value bits, you know, higher value things within the craft. And I think lino cutting is one of them. It's not common, you know, it's a slightly expensive craft to get into. I think the kit that I bought was like $44 and then I bought some extra linoleum and then I bought some fabric paint, which is like three or $4 a tube. I mean, you can get coupons to most craft stores or even online, so that can be cheaper. But if you think about it, you could cut something you know, a, a design or a print, and then be able to make multiple prints. You could print that on fabric. You could sell those as fabric panels. I mean, the linoleum, I didn't see it at the craft store very big, but I'm sure you, online you can find really big sheets. You could be printing some pretty big stuff. And then I realized if I, you know, if you look at a printing press, you know, it's, it's kind of a rolling kind of thing where you layer everything and then you roll it through. That's basically what an AccuQuilt Go is, and I already have one of those. So long as I find the right stack of layers to put together, I could potentially roll it through the AccuQuilt Go to get a really good solid print. So just diff some different ideas that just has gotten me thinking. I'm always looking for things like this, uh, and and I'm always paying attention to, you know, when I see a lot of images of just really, you know, elaborate detailed hand stitching, you know, in a, you know, like an embroidery hoop. There was a, there was someone I was following that kind of did this kind of thing. And she, she did this really elaborate hand embroidery in these tiny little embroidery hoops. It was beautiful stuff. And then she was selling the, uh, the designs as patterns. And then she was also selling the originals. And uh, it just seemed like, you know, a lot of effort and a lot of work going into each piece 
And then, you know, certainly she was selling them for, you know, it was like a four inch hoop. She was selling it for $300 as an original piece of artwork. But still, the amount of time on her hand, you know, the effort and, and, and wear and tear on her hands, I just, I kind of worried that that might not be something that is sustainable long term. And this has always been my criticism of making stuff and selling the thing. You know, uh, I, the reason why I've always been critical of that is because um, right after I dropped out of college, what I did was I sewed garments for a living and I would pick up garments uh, on Friday every day, every week. And I pick up a bag and it was already all cut for me. Uh, and I'd take them to my little apartment with Josh and sew like crazy and kind of catalog everything and, and get it all listed in order of what was most difficult and try to knock out all the difficult stuff first and then the easy stuff towards the end of the week. I would maybe have, if I, if I really timed everything right and I was really, really careful about how much I was sewing, then I might get Thursday, half of Thursday off. But it was extreme detailed stuff. I was getting up at 6 a.m. I was sewing until 9 p.m. at night. Uh, it was it was basically the same finish that your garment is that you buy at the store. You know, it was surged edge, top stitching. Uh, and these were super plus size garments. These were not tiny, you know. So when I would get a pair of pants, it was like triple extra large. Uh, and I got to a point where I could whip through one of those in about 45 minutes, but even still, I was only being paid six bucks <laughs> for a pair of pants that big. And it really made me connect, like my time and energy is worth money and I can spend it killing myself for a couple bucks an hour, or I can do this a different way. And I can spend that time and energy, make something that I don't sell that thing. I sell a pattern to make it, or I sell a pretty picture of it, or you know something along those lines instead, you know, a digitized design, something like that. Um, you know, and my worry a lot of times is that a lot of people expect to be able to make a living off of making the thing. And there's always that break point where, you know, let's say you make something that's really, really popular uh, and a lot of people really want it. Uh, and you're getting now like, you know, tons of orders or, or you're filling up your Etsy shop or your website with the thing. Uh, a good example of this is uh, the watercolor. I follow a, a water homemade watercolor maker. They actually make the pigments <laughs> watercolor. It's really, really cool. But they probably put, you know, 20 things up on their shop at a time. And then it's like gone in seconds. It's just poof, gone. Uh, that's high demand. But if you can't produce enough to meet that demand, you're going to start making people angry, you know? So it's, all of this is kind of, you know, it, it's a tangent. But my point of view is just, be very careful about making a thing and selling the thing, unless it's really not about the money, unless it is really just about enjoying making the thing, um, then it doesn't matter, you know? Uh, and it's not about how much you're making per hour and that kind of thing. Uh, it's instead just about the joy of stitching and making something. Uh, and it, it is definitely something that I have thought about a lot. And it's something I've definitely thought about uh, I, I've considered making stuff and selling it, you know, whether it be, you know, lino prints, you know, something with leather work, some easier projects that, you know, even embroidery, you know, things that I can make that are small and manageable and don't take a lot of time and not a lot of hand finishing that are my style and um, my artwork, you know, like I could see cutting out a goddess in linoleum being able to make prints of that, being able to make fabric panels of that, that would be really cool. Uh, I could see doing something like that. I could never see making a whole goddess quilt and selling that as a finished piece of art. You know, it just doesn't compute, right? So yeah, those are my thoughts at least on, on that style of thing. And I'm always looking for other ways to increase the value of our craft. And I do think it's very unfair. You know, you can get into traditional painting and, you know, learn what you're, you know, learn how to do it, learn how to do it right. And if you have the confidence to get into a, you know, a local, um, you know, art co-op, that kind of thing, you can be putting, you know, two, $300 on a painting that you've just made. And, you know, 
as long as people are interested in and like your work, then that will sell and that's accepted. Versus a quilt, you know, sometimes in some places you're lucky to get $300 for a quilt. And I just, I do find that unfair. My solution is just to simply say, don't sell, <laughs> don't sell it, you know, don't do it that way. But I know there's a lot of people that want to be able to make something and be able to sell it. So what am I working on now? I have got lots of Miss Bunny parts. <laughs> it's like disembodied <laughs> organs here on the table next to me. And I have been testing a lot. I'm getting ready to shoot the official uh, how to make Miss Bunny tutorial. And in order to be able to shoot that really fluidly and, and be able to make it, you know, really go nicely, I really need to have all of the parts kind of in all of the stages already prepped up and ready to go. And so you're getting a little bit of the behind the scenes here of what I do for, you know, a lot of tutorials. Uh, and it involves a lot of step outs. Basically, you know, instead of thinking about cutting out one block, sometimes I have to think about cutting out two or three. And, uh, and then my question and something I do agonize about a little bit is what do I do with all the extra pieces? You know, what do I do with all those extra bits that are left over? And I actually have two bins that are just full of extra bits from step outs that I've, you know, something I've half pieced, a block I've pieced, like maybe a quarter of, uh, whole quilts, you know, like a chunk of a quilt, a row of a quilt, all stashed in that one box. And, uh, Pepper Corey came to the Charlotte Quilt Guild the other day and she was talking about a technique and it's a Japanese word that unfortunately I've forgotten, uh, but definitely go check out peppercorey.com and I'm sure she's got a, a little listing on it. It's one of the lectures and one of the workshops she's offering now. But it's basically a term uh, from uh, Japan where they would take China and let's say a, a China bowl or cup was broken and instead of just gluing it back together and kind of kludging it and it looking really ugly, they would take it to a jeweler and they would line the broken edges with gold and glue it back together again, lined with gold. So you have the fractured effect of the broken cup, but then now you have all the seams locking together in gold. I think that I just love the sound of that. I love the imagery of that. I love everything about that. So I've been thinking about that a lot. Pepper showed her quilts, uh, which were very inspiring. Basically, you know, let's say you get to a project and it's just not working. You know, there's there's some things that are just glitchy with it. it you know, don't like the colors. Maybe it was years ago. It's a UFO. You've been you've stashed it in a bin. Something went wrong. You ran out of the right fabric. You know, just something was a problem with that. So you put it away and then what you do is pull it back out again and take a look at it. And if, you know, it really isn't ever going to be finished the way it is, then consider doing this technique. And very simply, what I could kind of glean from what Pepper was showing, you just slice it up and then stick another background color between all of the fractured bits. Uh, and I would definitely go for gold. Uh, I, you know, it's kind of hard to find metallic gold fabric, but uh, I think that would be really pretty. Black or white could also work too. And the idea is to really fracture it up and, and let it be random and crazy and uh, like a shattered piece of china. I love that. I love the whole idea of that. So I have this whole bin of <laughs> step outs of all of the bits and pieces that I have not finished over the years. So I'm thinking about pulling that out and maybe doing a couple blocks just slicing it up and, you know, putting some, you know, uh, lining it with gold or lining it with black or white or some other, I've got a lot of gray fabric, I think. Actually, you know what I have a lot of? Dad and I have nearly sliced my entire stash up into pieces, but we still have a lot of orange. We reached a point and it was like, okay, we gotta stop. We needed to take a break from having the table completely covered with fabric. And it was right at the point where I'd pulled out this whole stash of orange that I'd planned to use in the forged and welded quilt. So this was 2011. I've been holding on to this stuff since 2011. So I have all this orange, bright orange, solid yardage. Maybe that's what I need to do. I need to pull that out. That's going to be my glue to uh, combine together all of these scraps of various colors. And I'll make some really wild <laughs> orange background quilts. 
I know that sounds hideous just on paper, but uh, I think it could be pretty cool. And I think you know, we have to give ourselves permission to do something random with our UFOs and to get them out of their stuck state, to get them out of that place where you can't work on it anymore and you just don't even wanna look at it anymore. I think sometimes you've gotta do something kind of radical to break free from that. So a uh, little update on what's going on with the Free Motion Quilting Project. I told you last week, I think it was, that I was expecting to have that done and have a brand new website uh, for the blog. And it's just taking a little bit more time than, of course, all of this kind of stuff takes a little bit more time than you think. That's okay. Uh, I am super, super happy with how it's looking and I cannot wait for this to be done. It's gonna be such an awesome new system once it's all finished and I'm trying to be patient. It's very hard though when, when and, and this has happened before, when I have a site that is like, I think of a, a website like your house um, and think about moving house. Whenever you're moving, it's really hard to be creative. It's really hard to, you know, have people over and have a dinner party. Uh, and that's what it feels like with blogging, you know, to me at least. Uh, when I'm posting a blog post, it's like I'm having people over and, and we're having a, a, you know, a nice chat or I'm, I'm teaching you a class in my house. And when I have this site work going on, it feels like I'm moving house and things are in boxes and all discombobulated and I am distracted and I don't feel like I can be posting or should be posting. I start questioning you know, where things are going. <laughs> I misplaced the tea set. No, kidding. Uh, and you know, it just, it just, it's just, it's just distracting more than anything else. It's distracting. So that's why I haven't been blogging as much on the Free Motion Quilting Project. Don't worry, it's coming back. I'm going to be getting back to blogging daily uh, through November, definitely, and December. And then we, of course, have the new Leah's uh, Friendship Quilt Along starting in January. That's going to be super, super exciting. So definitely want to get all of this finished up way before then so we can test the site, make sure it's all working great. Uh, one big thing, and this is part of the reason why it's just a little bit delayed, is I'm working on a system so that you can upload com uh, images in your comments so that if you want to share a picture of a quilt that you've made or you're having trouble with the block and you know you want some help and guidance then you can post an image uh, to the free motion quilting project along with your comment ask your question and then get the help you need so it's you know combining that you know that nice sharing that we had on the Facebook group but it's not on Facebook which is really important because uh, I don't know if you heard you know there was another uh, you know, kind of data breach and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I'm starting to feel like a lot of these places are just not safe uh, to be posting a lot of photos. You know, certainly, I don't know if you've ever taken a look at um, the Facebook terms of service as far as photos and stuff go. I mean, basically you upload something there, it's theirs. You, they can do whatever they want to with it. And yeah, not all of that is all that great. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. I'm really wanting to get all of that wonderful interaction back on the Free Motion Quilting Project. Uh, I love teaching. I really, really do. It's so much fun uh, to be able to share videos. I love filming new videos uh, and thinking of new things to share. Uh, and then, of course, I love design. Uh, I've been missing it. And we reached day 500 in August or September. And Josh has been like, when are you gonna go film some new designs? And I realized, you know, when we have these big numbers, they're stopping points. It's really easy when you hit something big like that and it's like, oh, I hit that point. And then it's like, you know, a stop in the road, a finish line of sorts. And finish lines are not good. Uh, you know, finish lines imply a stop. And, and this is something that I picked up from Gretchen Rubin, she is an excellent author on habits and, and productivity uh, and, and positive habit forming. And she talks about how uh, whenever you're doing something continually, like let's say you take yoga classes and then maybe that yoga class that you were taking, maybe that gets paused through the summer. Don't think of it as a stop, just think of it as a pause because in order to get back to it, all you have to do is hit play. You know, and play sounds good. Starting over, that's kind of, it, it seems drudgery. You know, it seems, that seems more difficult. That seems more challenging. So 
yeah, I'm really looking forward to all of that. I'm gonna get back to free motion quilting designs. And I'm thinking the new designs, I'm probably gonna shoot half the video on the home machine and then half the video on the long arm. It's a challenge and it's a push to me to try out designs on the long arm where I'm tending to go with easy stuff because, you know, it, it is easier. <laughs> and I think it's better to really push myself and, uh, you know, try different things and keep seeing what is easy and what is challenging and, and just be noting the differences between the different machines. And I just, I enjoy both types of quilting. I really, really do. Uh, and I think it's really neat to see, okay, here's a design on a small scale on a whole machine. Here's what you can do really easily here. Now let's take it to a long arm. Let's see how it looks different. It's gonna look different. It's gonna feel different. It's going to probably stitch different even. So I am really looking forward to shooting new videos and sharing new tutorials. You know, it, it's just one of those things when I feel like I've got one foot in one thing, in that case, it's, you know, the free old blog, the old Free Motion Quilting Project blog on Blogger, uh, and then one foot in the new thing, and this is the new WordPress site that we're setting up. It's just really distracting. And I'm hoping that that's gonna be resolved this week and it's all gonna be taken care of. Uh, I have had a lot of wonderful help on this transition and I have been working with wpbeginner.com and that is wordpressbeginner.com. Uh, they have been super, super helpful. If you are wanting to migrate uh, from a blogger blog to a WordPress site, I highly recommend them. They have been they have been really, really spot on. And I just got a few little things to fix up and then that will be ready to go. So uh, one last thing we do have, Melly the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt. This is still on pre-order until October 31st. If you'd like to get a discount on the book and have it signed by me, definitely pick up a copy right now. You can check it out at leahday.com slash Mally. That's where you can find it. Uh, and there's another podcast episode where I read the first chapter and a little bit of the second chapter. So definitely check that out too. And yes, I am pursuing an audiobook. Today, I, uh, I actually just signed up for a course on recording audiobooks and using Audacity to edit. This is so mega complicated and I am trying not to be intimidated by it. Uh, basically, you know, uh, the submission requirements for an audiobook are very complicated. And if you don't get your audio just exactly right, then you might have to completely re -ed, you know, re record it and re edit it again. Uh, it can end up with your book in limbo for months, if not years. It just sounds like a lot of complicated stuff, but I'm trying to, like I pursue everything, I'm trying to go one step at a time, learn what I can. Uh, and I'm also trying to in, you know, involve Josh in this and be like, you need to learn this too. <laughs> so that way he can help me edit uh, because that's gonna be more than anything else. I think that's gonna be the biggest challenge. Uh, and it's making sure that the noise in the house isn't so loud that it messes up the audio. It's making sure that when I do something crazy like scream, you know, and, and there are some screaming bits in the book that I absolutely cannot wait. There's like two characters that I cannot wait to narrate. Um, actually, while I was recording, the, uh, like when Riley I was writing the book, I would stop and read those sections. So I'm really looking forward to reading that for the audiobook. Uh, I am setting up a little studio in my bedroom closet and after three different tries of camera mounts and microphone mounts, I finally got the right setup. And this is the thing, it's like in learning anything new, whether you are learning quilting or embroidery or long arm quilting or free motion quilting on a home machine, piecing or audiobook recording, you know, it always starts at the beginning, you know, learn as much as you can from uh, courses and from people that know what they're doing that do that professionally. And, you know, go from there and then, you know, keep trying, keep trying. Uh, when you get frustrated, it's okay to walk away. And that's the thing I'm reminding myself, you know, if I, if I record, uh, I'm going to start recording 10 minute segments and, and then editing and playing and, and, checking it out and seeing if it's actually working. And I'm gonna try that, you know, just once a day until I get everything solid. And then I'll start doing long sessions, an hour or two a day. 
and knocking through the book. And I'm really looking forward to that. I love audio. I am definitely an audiophile. I mostly listen to books, not read them. And I knew that the audio was going to be important for Mally the Maker. But, you know, just like making the images and doing doing the cover art and all that kind of stuff, I kind of just waited and waited and waited um, to pursue even looking into it until the very, very end. And I think that's okay. You know, sometimes you, you know, you can bite off more than you can chew way too early in the process. And I'm really glad I have a finished final book um, rather than I'm working, you know, like with the edited file. I, I'm glad that I am at this stage uh, because I think it would be very tempting to start changing things. You know, as I'm reading through, I'm like, oh, I could change out that word. No, it's already a book. <laughs> you can't do that, Leah. So yes, the audiobook is coming soon. Can't say exactly when. Most likely though, I will say for book two, if this works out and I manage to get this uploaded to Audible and we manage to make an audiobook, and I'm still saying manage because I still don't know if this will be possible with the setup that I have in my bedroom closet. I don't know if I'll be able to do it or not, but if I'm able to do it, then I think I'll probably launch book two as audio first. And that'll be cool. That'll be really cool. Uh, yeah, so just lots of fun things going on. And I am on chapter three of book two. Uh, I have had some ups and downs, but I am planning on not necessarily participating in NaNoWriMo in November, but I am planning on upping my word count in a big way. And yes, I do really write to word count. It just really works for me. It's kind of like the way you make a quilt. You know, I start with a diagram on a, of a quilt or a sketch of a quilt. I start with the blocks. I go from the blocks to the quilt. Um, I, it, the same thing for writing works really well for me. I start with an outline. Uh, I break the outline into pieces. Those pieces need to be a certain word count. <laughs> and then I write to that word count. And Josh is always like, well, you might end up with a lot of filler in there, you know, just trying to meet that word count. And I'm like, well, that's what you're for, for editing. You know, if I have filler in there, then you can chop it out and rearrange it and then it all ends up working out right. And that's exactly what we did with book one. I wrote to the word count, Josh went in and chopped. And then by the time I wrote all of it, I didn't mind that I was losing, you know, two or 3,000 words here or there, still ended up with a 90,000 word book, you know. Um, that's a little <laughs> book writing specific, but you get the idea. Like that's how my brain works. The only way I learned how to do that uh, and learn that structure is by uh, trial and error and experimentation. I also took a course on book writing in order to just learn, you know, what are the basic requirements and, and what is the structure of a novel? Just like a quilt has a certain structure, a novel has a certain structure too, or at least the good novels that make you want to turn the pages and get to the end. You know, uh, it's so funny. All, all books on writing include a little, um, <laughs> <laughs> a little cautionary tale of, well, you can follow these rules if you want to write a book people want to read. If you want to write an artistic, <laughs> crazy novel that sends people off on tangents all over the place, that's entirely up to you. But this book won't help you with that. So I always love it whenever they write something like that. Because, you know, there's always those people that want to break the rules and do something totally different. That's not me. I want to make something that you want to read and are excited to get to the end of it and then are excited to get to book two. That's really the main point. So I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. I know I was kind of all over the place, but I did get something done. I got all of my Miss Bunny appendages turned right side out. They're all ready to go. I am going to half stuff the arms and legs and get those ready. And I am one step closer to making that an awesome tutorial. And that tutorial on Miss Bunny making her body will probably be out next Monday. And then the patterns and the books will be shipping on November 1st. So come and pre-order a copy of Melly the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt. Uh, here's a picture of Miss Bunny. You can also pre-order her, her sewing pattern. Uh, and we have those finishing up. Dad's doing some testing and it's so nice to have an extra set of eyes on this. I know the pattern's gonna be so much stronger because uh, Dad and I learn very differently. Dad has not been sewing very much. He's been making quilts, but not sewing. And so having his hands in it and his point of view has really made the pattern that much better. And then of course the tutorial is gonna help guide you along the way too. So I hope that you'll pre-order our copy of the book or the sewing pattern or both if you want. Come and check it out at leahday.com slash Mally. 
And if you'd like to find more podcast episodes, you can find all of them linked up together at leahday.com slash podcast. Until next time, let's go quilt.